It's an honor to be able to interview today His Grace Bishop Irenae, the Bishop of London and Western Europe for the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia. Your Grace, thank you for entertaining this interview. Happy to be with you. I'd like to begin our discussion with a reflection on the relationship between orthodoxy and the internet. Mm. Uh, in these last years, the orthodox presence uh, on the internet and particularly in social media has just exploded, especially uh, during the COVID period. So many people turn to the internet yeah. in order to find some sort of uh, spiritual nourishment since many of them weren't able to go to church mm -hmm. and other things. Your Grace, could you share with us a little bit about your perspective on internet orthodoxy or orthodoxy on the internet? Well, maybe we can start by distinguishing those two things. Um, orthodoxy on the internet, I think, is a valid concept that the church should use every tool at her disposal has been part of our history from the beginning. There was a time when books were very modern and innovative, but we used them and we make good use of them. Uh, the internet is something newer, social media even newer than that. And there's no intrinsic reason why we shouldn't use these for the promulgation of the faith and the information of the world as to what we believe and why they ought to believe it. Orthodoxy on the internet is our use of a tool to accomplish some good. What I find concerning is internet orthodoxy. Hmm. Uh, and this I would characterize as a kind of transformation, usually not intentional, but happening accidentally, in which the ethos of orthodoxy is translated from living encounters experienced in the church into an environment which is characterized by an internet presence almost more than other things, to where church life might be an important part of what a person does himself or herself, but in which the great arena of spiritual growth is more and more concentrated in this digital medium. And this I find concerning and a problem, something that we need to think about carefully as we carry on in this century and really dissect using the criteria of the church as to what is spiritually helpful and what isn't. Before I follow, mm -hmm. Uh, on with uh, your comments and ask you to articulate exactly what your concerns are. I do remember, and uh, I'd like you to clarify for me, if I'm not mistaken, you yourself were a pioneer in bringing orthodoxy to the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm wondering if you could share us a little bit about what you were doing in years past. I'm thinking this is many years ago. But what did you do and uh, how did you yourself utilize the internet? Probably the only experience that uh, leads me to be called a pioneer <laughs> in anything. Uh, it was quite some time ago, it was in the very late 90s, when the World Wide Web was just coming into public use. Uh, and at the time, uh, I created a website about the writings of the fathers and about the monastic culture of orthodoxy, which was one of, it's hard to imagine this now as being true, but it was true, uh, was one of exactly four orthodox websites on the World <laughs> Wide Web. Now there are hundreds of thousands, everyone has one, and these days it's hard to really know where a site starts and social media stops and what's what. But at the time there was very little, and I was very enthusiastic about taking up this tool that we hadn't had before to bring resources of orthodoxy to a wider populace. This was at a time when it was very hard for English speakers to find the writings of the fathers. Uh, publications were not very popular. There was no internet database of translations. Uh, and so that was really what I started out to do, was to take these texts that I had loved, that had been so transformational for me, and simply try to make them accessible to people. We translated, I had a few people helping me, we translated texts from the fathers and posted them online, occasionally uh, commentaries, and so on. And this was at Monachos? This was Monachos.net, a site that I eventually ended up retiring into the sunset about five years or six years ago. We did use the precursor to social media, something that was still called message boards at the time, to allow some conversation. 
that wasn't available at the beginning, but when it became available, we took it up. But we worked very hard, and I remember long hours of discussion with other priests and monks about how we would craft that environment, because it was very important to us, even then, before social media, that discussions had to be had in an orthodox way. Mm -hmm. We didn't simply want a free-for-all of people coming to express their opinions, because all of us recognized and tried to follow the model of orthodoxy, which is that personal opinion and interpretation are not a a great good that we seek after, but instead to submit our wills to the teachings of the church. And so we crafted, I remember, a rather elaborate terms of use for this discussion aspect of the site, which was specifically intended to not make it a conversational environment, but allowed the possibility to pose questions. And then there were a few people who operated with an explicit blessing from their bishops and from their spiritual fathers in order to respond not with their own opinions, but with references to the writings of the fathers so that people could learn what yes. the church teaches. And that we found very helpful. But times progressed, the social media came along, and it really transformed the nature of the discussion. I remember accessing many, many times your Monaco site and being confronted with texts, uh, some very rare texts, some texts that I actually never had seen before in the English language. Mm. Uh, but I, I appreciated, and I still appreciate this about your pedagogy, how focused upon the scriptural text and focused upon the patristic text uh, you were. And you would also do long form evaluation of texts, which I also love. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just a little quote here right. to explain something that you yourself were using your words to convince us of. But, uh, it was a marvelous presentation of the texts of the fathers. I remember it's particularly your, your emphasis on the apostolic fathers, yes. which was so prominent on, yes. on the site. Well, I, I view that to this day as a uh, kind of a model of engagement. Uh, we at PNP have been trying to follow something similar with mm -hmm. regards to content, uh, little opinion, solidly rooted in scripture and the, and the writings of the fathers. Could you unpack for us a little bit about your concerns and what you're seeing develop uh, as the Orthodox presence has exploded on the internet? What, what are you concerned about? I'm concerned chiefly about a transformation or a loss of an Orthodox mindset to learning. There is an Orthodox manner to learn from the Fathers. It's not simply the content of the Fathers themselves, the texts that they write. That's important, and without that you can't really study them at all. And that's why earlier on it was so essential to make these texts available. And I remember how we used to labor for hours to translate the, apost the Apostolic Fathers or some other text in order to put it online. That need kind of disappeared as the internet progressed, as scanning technology became better. Now essentially every edition is available online. Um, and so the labors of individuals like myself or other to translate one text or another, it, not that there aren't still texts to be translated, but the bulk of patristic writings are certainly now available and others are gradually being added. What concerns me is the manner in which these texts are transmitted. Orthodox pedagogy is a living encounter. It has always been since the days of the apostles, sitting at the feet of a teacher who teaches us, not by some programmatic schema of instruction, but as a personal encounter a teacher, be it a priest, a monk, or a bishop, or someone blessed for catechesis, has always been in orthodoxy someone who knows his student, who knows the disciple. And therefore the form of education, the way the fathers are presented, what is said about them, which texts are, are put before them, is a relationship of a lived encounter, a living experience. And what troubles me very much about so much that I see today in terms of internet orthodoxy is the idea that these texts should simply be thrown at people with no living encounter at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that discussion happens according to a much more modern idea that everyone has an opinion to share and everyone has an interpretation. But this is again not authentic to orthodoxy. We don't listen to everyone. We listen to those illumined by God to teach and those blessed by the church to provide instruction. And the rest of us learn how to quiet our opinions, how to conform our thoughts to what is being taught, 
rather than introduce our thoughts into the teaching. And that I find very rare yes. in the current day. So much of internet orthodoxy exists in this ethereal plane. Texts that I read online, comments that I make online, thoughts that are expressed online. But however informative an online presence can be, it will never be a personal encounter. Yes. It is never the same as sitting face to face in this moment with someone who comes to know me, who is caring for my soul, not just by throwing text. It's like walking into a pharmacy and having someone just throw all of the medicine at you. Sure. That's not going to save your soul. It might kill you, in fact, if you're not ready for that medicine. You need a good physician who knows your ailment and can prescribe the right medicine. And this, I simply, I'm not saying that it can't happen. It's just that I don't see it happening yes. in online internet orthodoxy. Those who are evaluating the impact of uh, digital media and learning to set aside books as our culture is, unfortunately, and embrace uh, a reading primarily on uh, the screen, note that our attention span is greatly shrinking and that we're not able to really follow thoughts so much because we're often reading articles that have hyperlinks in them. Just as we're making our way through one thought, we're distracted to yet another yes. thought and yet to another thought and yet to another thought. Also, the whole question of authoritative sources, which I think you're, you're addressing too, both the, the place of the fathers and also the living authoritative source of a spiritual father who knows you, who can help you interface between the tradition and your own life, seem to me to be completely up in the air today. Mm. At the same time, so many are discovering uh, holy orthodoxy uh, yeah. through online presences. If you were going to give your counsel to someone, uh, and in fact, you recently did this for Patristic Nitro Publications. You mm -hmm. recently sat with our board and provided some archpastoral guidance for us, some wisdom on how we might continue our work in a way that you think pleases Christ. If you were going to give that, that counsel in general to people who are investing themselves in ministry online, mm -hmm. what would that be? What would that look like? What would you say to them? Well, one very simple test that doesn't encompass everything, nothing does, but one simple test that's very essential is does it, whatever it might be, a website, a forum, a context, does it result in a life being drawn into the living experience of the church? Mm. If the answer to that is yes, then one can have a certain confidence that one is on the right path. If by going to a certain site and exposing myself to what is provided there, the end result is I more energetically, more enthusiastically rush into the temple to talk to a living priest, to be a part of the living reality of the church, which is God's body and is never led astray, then this has brought about an orthodox result. If the result of going to it, again, whatever it might be, is that I simply grow in my intellectual comprehension of what such and such a father said, or if the result is that I become more enlightened as to some theme, but more divorced from actual church life as a result, because I am either judging the church or afraid of the church or upset with the church, or I view that my understanding of what I have now been exposed to is greater than the church's, then one should be deeply cautious. Even the writings of the fathers can produce negative results in us if we read them in such a manner that leads us away from the church. Yes. So can the Holy Scriptures. And we see countless people purporting to be scriptural, and yet their interpretation of the Scriptures rends them away from the Church of Christ. And the same with the Holy Fathers. There's nothing intrinsically holy or pious about quoting the Holy Fathers of the Church. Anyone can do it, and these days everyone does it. Sure. But I always point out in this context that the same is true of the Scriptures. Even the devil himself quotes the Scriptures. It's not just the text, it's the context in which we hear it and are exposed to it. The writings of the Fathers have the power to save us precisely by drawing us into the life of the Church. But when they are used simply to foster the intellect, 
and the most dangerous of all, when they are used to create in us a vision of orthodoxy that is less and less attached to the actual church, her bishops, her priests, her sacramental life together, and orthodoxy becomes increasingly something in my own head, divorceable from all of that, Uh that has to be a sign that things are going down the wrong path. So this is a test that I would certainly hold out in all places. And sadly, I have to say that the vast majority of Orthodox sites that I encounter on the internet fail this test. And that's a sad indictment of the current state of things, which I hope will will change. I hope so too. It's a new forum, a new platform, and it seems that acrimony is is almost built in Mm. to the, the core of the platform, especially with comments with this idea, this uh, almost addiction uh, that social media has nourished, that you can't read something or listen to something and be content to have a quiet reflection. You must say what you think about it. Uh, For the vast majority of our work at Patristic Nectar, we have never had comments. As a matter of fact, I've had no interest in comments ever. Recently, uh, our our board has asked me uh, as an avenue for um, re- reaching out, especially to people who are in places where there are not Orthodox churches, mm. and many, many people are discovering Orthodoxy now from lands all over the world yeah. in which they have no living Orthodox right. source at all. Right. If we could allow some, some comments, uh, we're moderating them very carefully, and, and I thank God, have nothing to do with them whatsoever. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> I thank my board for not asking me to do that because mm-hmm. I wouldn't want it to want it to have done that. But it seems that this, this the very modicum, the, the very structure of the, of the social media forms this, this, mm-hmm. this acrimonious spirit or the spirit almost forcing you not to be contented at peace unless you say something, which yeah. is nursing pride. Uh, we, I think, should remember, I, I try to remember myself, what a holy father or a holy mother is. Why do we care about their words? It's not because they were brilliant or that they had great degrees like your grace does, uh, academically, so to speak, but because they loved God so magnificently, they literally became the presence of Christ on the earth. And therefore what they did and what they said became kind of canonically normative for people on what a human being is and how to live. And that should I be, we're, we're, we're encouraging uh, at PNP our, our friends who are coming, our acquaintances who are coming and listening to have that in their minds. Mm-hmm. That the goal is to know God better, the goal is to apply this to your life uh, and to try to come away. We, we, call it, we call our goal to nourish the spiritually thirsty with the sweet teachings of the Holy Fathers, to let it be something that your soul is yearning for truth. You want to hear a word uh, so that you can apply it, so that you can live it. Well, and there you hit on a key theme. You hear the word so that you can apply it. That's the essential. To just hear the word on its own might have a certain value, yes. But ultimately, it just gets thrown into all the other words that are in my head. The church is not about fostering our mental library. It's about changing our lives. And so having that as a, as a goal is, is wonderful. And I've always admired about Patristic Nectar, and the reason I've always maintained my support for this work is precisely that I see you deliberately trying to avoid some of these pitfalls. The commenting pitfall is a serious one. We live in a world where the new mantra, the new doctrine is that every person has a voice on every subject and that every voice has value in its own right. Well. Every human life has value, but it's certainly not the case that every voice has value. There are many voices that have little value, and there are some voices whose value is expressly negative. How are we to know the one from the other? In the living tradition of orthodoxy, we are taught how to discern a good voice from a bad because we are in a relationship of obedience. Now, the comments that you might entertain from these people who can't come into the church, all right, or can't come into a physical church because of where they live, there isn't one, all right, explore this possibility, but always keep watch over what's happening and how it's happening. I would say this, a great test of any time that we deliver an interpretation, 
whether that comes through a commentary that we write or statements that we make in response to questions or even this choice of texts that we choose to put in front of people. The best test of our authenticity is that we should be able to disappear from things after that and someone should be able to go to another source in the church and be affirmed that the teaching is the same. If I am necessary in order to show you that what I'm saying is right and someone else is wrong, I've already fallen down the trap of self-authority. It should be the case. If what I am teaching is the teaching of the church, I should be able to deliver it to you and you should never have to see me again because if you go to some other true teacher, they should say the same thing. And if they don't, one of us is wrong. Yes. Right? But so much of what happens on the internet are these kind of closed circles where I go to this site because it's going to teach me real orthodoxy, but the only place is going to be there. Right? Yes. And every place else is increasingly devoid of this truth, increasingly fallen and debased. Only here do we hear what the fathers really have to say. This is a denial of God's presence in the church. Mm. Right? The fathers from the very beginning have said, in the church, you can go to any part of the church and hear the voice of truth. Yes. We will, of course, encounter error in the church. Man introduces sin and error uh, and always has but the church corrects this through her common testimony. But we live in a day of kind of accidental self-righteousness where I have to stand up and purify the church's fallen doctrine. And I always point out this is essentially Protestantism. You can quote the Holy Fathers of the Orthodox world as much as you want, but if you're doing so in order to to define a church life that is my understanding, my creation, that is me correcting what's wrong everywhere else. Martin Luther was doing the same thing. Mm. He was just quoting a different set of texts. That's not our goal. Let us put the words of the Holy Fathers before people. If called upon to answer questions, let us do so briefly. But the goal should always be, read this text I have given you, and if you have questions, go to your priest and ask. Yes. You don't need to come to me. I've simply done a small offering of putting this text in front of you. But any ordained and pious, humble leader of the church should be able to answer. Of course, the problem, and people will always raise the problems in order to explain things away. Well, there are certain priests and even bishops and even patriarchs in our day who are not teaching the truth. Does that mean the the experience of error? Does that mean that God has abandoned his church? Mm. Does it mean that I must be the self-appointed voice of error by the text that I choose to show you and the commentary I choose to give? No, the church herself will correct these issues if we live in obedience to her. Thank you for these thoughts, your grace. Very edifying and we're deeply appreciative. Thanks be to God. Sounds good.